Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a few minutes, but I'm about to launch a poll right now through Zoom. So please respond to that so I can get a better sense of how everyone's planning on facilitating their courses in the fall. Another quick note in the chat pod, you have the option to uh, respond in the chat to all panelists, which will send it to myself, Ms. Courtney A. Bear, and Ms. Hala Esmail, uh, or you have the option to also send it to all panelists and attendees, meaning that other attendees in the workshop will be able to see your questions or comments. So just wanted to make that distinction as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the HyFlex course model design and delivery workshop. This is our second workshop in a series of five workshops that are being provided by LSU Online to assist faculty in developing or redeveloping their courses for the fall 20 semester. Uh, we have a full list of our offerings on our LSU Online training and events website, and we'll make sure that gets in the chat for you. In our first workshop, which was last week, we discussed the basic principles of course design. And this week, we'll be talking about a specific course model called HyFlex and how you can apply some of those strategies to your own course. 
Um, so you may want to have a document or you know something that you can write down some notes or questions um, as we're going through the webinar. I'm Courtney Abair, and I'm a learning experience designer with LSU Online and Continuing Education, and I'm joined with my colleague, Lydia. Hi, I'm Lydia Treadwell. I'm also a learning experience designer, or LXD, as they say with the lingo, at LSU Online and Continuing Education. So for those of you who may not know, um, we're part of the LSU Online Design Development Team, and what we do at LSU Online is we work closely with faculty to create high quality learning experiences by incorporating instructional design, user experience, and other design principles. But we also facilitate faculty development offerings, such as this workshop series, to provide support and guidance to faculty who are designing, redesigning, and teaching courses for blended or online delivery. Specifically in this workshop, we're going to define what the HyFlex course model is in its purest form. And then we're gonna break down some of the strategies that are used in that model and generate some ideas about how you can incorporate some of those strategies into your fall course. Note that this is a hands-on workshop in the sense that as a group, we're gonna work through a scenario and engage um, in generating some ideas. So feel free to put any of those ideas in the chat. We do have some team members who are monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to put them there. And we will try to get to all the questions at the end of the session. If we run out of time, we'll make sure we compile the questions and follow up with you. All right, thank you, Courtney. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling here. And I wanna just share the results, which I am very happy to see. Um, it looks like the majority of you are already planning on delivering your fall classes in a hybrid format. And this is a great starting point for HyFlex, which, spoiler alert, HyFlex com com uh, combines hybrid learning in a flexible course structure. So the fact that many of you are already considering hybrid for your course delivery is a great starting point. So because we like to follow our own best practices, um, I want to cover what our objectives are for the workshop. So by the end of this workshop, you will be able to describe the HyFlex course model. You'll be able to select effective elements of HyFlex course design for your course, and then identify some tools that you can incorporate in your HyFlex course elements. You'll notice that we don't have an objective that includes developing a comprehensive plan of how you'll execute HyFlex in one of your courses in the fall. However, um, because it, and we'll get into this later, but that is a, a very, very um, large undertaking to, to switch all of your courses to high flex. However, um, faculty have been encouraged to design their courses for the fall with the potential for disruption in mind, much like we had in the spring. And um, we think that this model can really provide you with a lot of flexibility for delivering your course, which is what many of us are looking to right now. We also recognize that there is a diverse group of faculty. So many of you may have specific questions about, okay, well, I teach this lab or this course, and how do I um, plan my HyFlex course for this particular topic? And we may not be able to address questions that are unique to your specific circumstance. We're just gonna provide you with some general ideas and strategies. However, uh, the members of LSU uh, Online and Continuing Education, our learning experience designer, designers will be um, active in our hypercare support hours, uh, which will start back up again um, on July 6th. They're paused right now through July 5th uh, to deal with our Moodle upgrade. But if uh, you have questions about how certain parts of your course could work in an online uh, course format, we encourage you to hop into those hy uh, hypercare hours and ask those questions with the learning experience designer um, the Faculty Technology Center will also be here to help you work through any um, potential issues that you might have with Moodle tools that we'll talk about today. Um, so without further ado, let's get into what exactly HyFlex is. So we know that the process of our emergency move to remote teaching at the end of the spring was not the ideal scenario. It was likely very stressful for both you as an instructor and for your students. 
Um, we recognize there's a lot of time and effort that goes into reworking course materials, as well as the fact that your students may have had a learning curve, um, not fully understanding or recognizing how um, to finish your course in a modality that they may or may not have experienced before. So like Lydia mentioned, we are trying to be proactive for the fall and provide you with some strategies and solutions for delivering your courses that are a little bit more flexible. And that's why we're covering specifically the, the model high flex. So again, we're trying to plan for a potential um, disruption so that we can continue to provide quality learning experiences. Please recognize we're not recommending an all or nothing approach here. So we're not recommending that you try to completely redesign all of your courses using this model as it was originally written. Instead, what we want you to think about is how can you use some of the strategies of HiFlex to design or redesign your course and choose pieces of the model to apply to your specific course. We'll start by looking at the three different modalities or formats that you are probably familiar with um, when designing or redesigning a course. So depending on your specific course and your course size, you, you may have a good idea of what modality you're gonna be using in the fall. It seems like many of you are gonna be using the hybrid um, course format. Face-to-face -face is of course where all of your activities are occurring in person in a brick and mortar classroom um, and you see your, your students on a daily and weekly basis you know, in the flesh, so to say. Sort of on the other end of the spectrum to that is online courses where all of your primary content um, activities and instruction occur online. Um, for us, that is most typically seen through our Moodle system. And then somewhere in the middle, we have this hybrid course modality, which is alternating between online activities and face-to-face -face activities so that the learning occurs in both of those formats. The HyFlex course model is essentially a model that combines all of those modalities, but it is its own separate and unique model. In other words, HyFlex is not about developing three separate versions of the same course, but instead you're developing one course that may incorporate three different modalities of learning. So as Courtney mentioned, um, high flex is shorthand for hybrid flexible. And as its name indicates, it proposes an extremely flexible approach, which allows students to choose between all three modalities. It's course design model that presents the components of hybrid learning and a flexible course structure. And it gives students the option of attending classes in the classroom, participating online or doing both. Um, and once you'll find, you know, this, this term was coined around 2006, but due to the recent pandemic, this has become such a hot topic um, and has kind of been revived into, you know, from obscurity into popularity. Um, and you can see why, because this offers a flexible format that, you know, uh, instructors could easily pivot if one of the formats, such as attending class in person, is no longer a viable option. Uh, so HyFlex not only provides multiple pathways for students to participate in class meetings, but it can also provide multiple pathways for students to actually reach the learning outcomes, which is kind of the more exciting part of this, uh, this course design model. So this is, you know, in its purest form, in its most ideal application, it's giving students the freedom to study when and where they want to based on their own needs, desires, and preferences. And as we know with students, these needs, desires, and preferences can change on a week-to-week -week or day-to-day -day basis. And HyFlex allows them to, um, to, to, to choose how they're going to participate in the classroom. Um, so we have students that may be uh, attending in person. They may be attending remotely via online, but you know, watching a live lecture. Or they may be uh, participating in the class asynchronously um, completing activities fully online, not attending at the same time as their classmates. With HyFlex, the course material itself, the course resources, 
are, off, are also offered in both face-to-face, -face, remotely, and online options. And we're using technology such as Moodle, such as Zoom, to help facilitate those options. Um, and then HyFlex also potentially offers different modes in which students can engage with both you and their fellow classmates, as well as potential for different modes of assessment. But we'll get into that. So now let's try to dig a little bit deeper into HyFlex, and we're going to talk about four guiding principles of HyFlex that will help guide some of your thinking as you're considering this course design model. So the first is learner choice, learner choice, learner voice, right? Um, and HyFlex takes modality, uh, the, the format in which you're teaching the course, and makes it a learner choice, allowing the learner to choose which will serve their learning style and current life circumstances best. Um, and this, like I said, may change week to week, day to day. So as you're thinking about transitioning a course to high flex, you have to first determine how much flexibility students need in order to adequately participate. Um, most situations require some level of time independence and location independence. So offering some options remotely, some options asynchronously um, as a resource for students to read or review on your own. The second principle of HyFlex is equivalency. And this means that you're providing learning activities in all participation modes that lead to equivalent course outcomes. This means that while learning outcomes do not change, the process may be different depending on the modality that students are participating in to get to those same outcomes. And so we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth, but to accomplish this, you have to be more intentional about your course design, utilizing that backwards design that we talked about in workshop one, starting out with your outcomes, making sure that your endpoint for all students is going to be the same, and then generating ideas for how students are going to reach that same outcome given different modes of participation. The third principle of high flex is reusability. And reusability is something that many of you are already doing, especially if you are designing your course in a hybrid model. This means that you're utilizing the artifacts or the resources that you produce in teaching the class as learning objects and making them available to all students. So previously, you know, for a face-to-face -face class, you might write up a, you know, an example problem, draw a model on the whiteboard or the chalkboard. And students can choose to take notes, take a picture, and refer to it later or not, right? But in the HyFlex course design model, you want to be mindful that any of these artifacts, these resources that you create throughout teaching, such as a PowerPoint, um, some sort of drawing illustration of a concept, making that available to students in all modalities. So that would just be a matter of pulling that PowerPoint, um, the recording of your lecture, and the drawing that you created, and making them available on your course site with Moodle. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're being more careful about making all of these artifacts, all these course resources available across all modalities. And a big part of reusability of making these artifacts available is the fourth principle of HyFlex, which is accessibility. And accessibility is making sure all of your resources are available and accessible to all students across all modalities. And this is something that uh, many of you probably struggled with last summer as you, um, you know, as you tried to fulfill the mandate that all course resources posted on Moodle be accessible. So some of you may already be very familiar with the, you know, the requirements to provide alt text for all images, uh, video recordings with captions, so on and so forth. So um, at, at its very, very base level, accessibility is making sure that all the resources that you post would be accessible to all students and meet those requirements. In a perfect world, accessibility also means ensuring that all students have access to the network, technology, and the skills related with accessing that network and technology to participate in those online modes. However, you can't control what students have access to, but it means providing options for students who may not have the same access to internet, the same access to a webcam, and supporting students who may have trouble accessing these modes of participation. So, you know, one of the beauties of HyFlex is if a student, you know, doesn't have a great internet connection, doesn't really enjoy interacting online as much, they can attend face to face because maybe that's what they're more comfortable with. Um, but just know, and, and we'll talk about this throughout, whenever possible, providing options for your students and working with them, meeting, meeting them where they are in terms of support for their um, online participation. So now that we've gone over the principles, 
why, why would we utilize such a model? Well, we're talking about this because it's a great way that you can plan to adjust for different emergency scenarios. We all know about the COVID-19 pandemic and you know, sort of the, the um, way in which it foisted us into this weird space where we're transitioning all of our instruction to remote at the drop of a hat. However, you know, we're living in South Louisiana, there also might be future emergency scenarios with hurricanes and weather events where some students are able to attend and come to campus and some students aren't. And so HyFlex might be a really good model to accommodate those students' needs as well. Um, talking about a, you know, a kind of more long-term application of HyFlex, um, HyFlex course design allows you to accommodate students for their individual extenuating circumstances. So maybe you have a student or a group of students who you know are going to be out of the country, maybe having to attend, attend and care for a family member who may not be able to attend class regularly. And by offering HyFlex course design, they can you know, make sure that they aren't missing out on what you're covering in class. Other student populations, such as student athletes, might miss large uh, amounts of class during the semester. You know, uh, during football season uh, in the fall, there's a lot of class missed. Same with baseball season in the spring. So high flex would allow those students to still attend classes. And then internships. So say, you know, you're directing a senior seminar and you have some students who can begin to attend uh, at the first part of the semester. Maybe they have to go on, they get an internship somewhere else in the country. High flex would ensure that they can continue to participate. And then finally, from a pedagogical standpoint, because you're offering students this powerful choice, you know, many of them may, may have never seen this amount of choice before. Of, oh, you mean I can either go to class or not and then decide to do that differently on a daily basis? It actually increases student engagement and buy-in because they have that choice. Um, they feel like you're catering to their experience and they have a more personalized engagement with you as the instructor. So, you know, that's, that's kind of my, my bid on why HyFlex can be really, really useful, not only in this moment, but in the future as well. So Lydia, do you mean that we have to design three different modalities for each course? So this is something that you may be scratching your head when you're finally starting to understand what I mean by HyFlex. So does this mean that I have to design for three different modalities for each of my courses? If you're teaching four or five courses next semester, that's a lot. <laughs> um, and to clarify the answer to the question, yes, to be fully high flex to execute this course design model to the T, you would be re rethinking the design of your course for three different modalities all at once. However, this is not the expectation. And then this is also not realistic uh, because if you, uh, even if the most experienced instructional designer or instructor who is well versed in high flex, it would be quite an undertaking for them to transition even one course before the beginning of fall to a fully high, high flex delivery. So there's no way that you're going to be able to convert all of your courses to an A plus high flex perfect delivery by fall semester especially if you don't think you'll ever use this model again. That's impractical, that's, that's a waste of time. Now that's not to say you're gonna hop off of this webinar now and say, oh, I don't need high flex. I think that you know, as we're going through these different strategies, you can pick and choose and integrate certain parts into the design of one or more of your courses, or even just one module, one week, one topic of your course. And you may even find that you utilize these strategies after COVID-19 is over. So be thinking in the back of your mind about those four principles we covered. We'll come back to them. But let's come up with a starting point. So where do you start? Um, as I mentioned before, when you're designing a course in a high flex model, it's more important than ever to consider that backwards design. Starting out with those outcomes and then determining how will all students reach that outcome and what are some different ways that students participating in different modes could still reach those same outcomes. Then start small and think deep. Like I said, even the most agile instructor would have a really hard time even you know, transitioning one course to high flex by the beginning of fall semester. So don't think about doing it for every course. Don't even think about doing it for an entire course. Think about how one particular module, 
assignment topic could potentially be moved to this high flex model. And as you're thinking, um, you know, think about how this could benefit your courses for the fall. What about after COVID-19? Could it be used strategically for certain parts of the semester or for fall semester over spring semester? Which assignments or modules might you transform? What potential barriers need to be addressed both on your end in delivering the course and from the student's perspective? What, what might be some barriers on their end? And then what do you need to learn to incorporate these strategies into your fall courses? We'll be talking about tools, we'll be talking about different ways that you can incorporate these tools into a high flex strategy, but you might have to do some more research on your end to be able to properly implement these tools. And finally, get organized. We encourage you to utilize some templates that we've provided. Um, we covered a course alignment map in the first workshop, and we'll be providing a slightly altered version of that same map that you could use to design a high flex module for your course. We also have those Moodle templates that make setting up your course and including important instructional language that will help guide the students through your course as a Moodle template. So consider using the resources that we've provided um, and we'll of course uh, provide these to you after this workshop is over with. So now let's talk about an example course. We're going to walk through that scenario that we teased at the beginning of this webinar. And as we're going through the scenario, start thinking about maybe one part of one of your courses that you could um, apply this high flex model to. Okay, so this is probably a going to be um, a, a common scenario that uh, we can use to transition some parts of a course to high flex. So let's imagine that in our um, in our course we're teaching a 2000 level course this fall that would be typically offered face to face and the instructor meets with the students three times a week for lecture. Those lectures include in-class discussions as well as um, a weekly quiz. But the instructor is, has decided that they want to offer the first week of the class as the high flex model to allow students who may not feel safe returning to campus yet to have the option to still complete the course content from their home. So let's walk through looking at these three main areas, the lectures, the discussions, and the weekly quizzes. How can we apply the high flex principles to redesign the first week of the class? What we're really going to want to think about, or where we're really going to want to start, is thinking about what choices the learners are going to have given the principles of high flex and what changes we need to make in the design of our course in order to incorporate the modalities that we decide are appropriate for this class. So now that we have an idea of what we want to consider, what we, what we need to brainstorm about, let's go back to the four principles of high flex to really guide and direct our efforts about the decisions we need to make. We recognize this is a lot to think about in a short amount of time, so don't worry if you can't flesh it all out right now, but you might want to jot down some preliminary notes. So remember or recall that the first principle of high flex is learner choice. So we need to start by thinking about what participation modes is this instructor going to allow students to choose from. Perhaps the instructor is going to allow all three modes in person, remote and online, or perhaps the instructor is only going to choose two and you need to decide on which two of those would be appropriate. So thinking about the lectures that the instructor needs to provide as well as the discussions that the instructor wants to have with the students. Consider what's the best way to deliver that content and what's going to be the best way to engage those students in the discussion about the content. The second principle of high flex is equivalency. So here we want to think about how are we going to ensure that students who participate and the participation modes that we decided on above are going to achieve the same outcome. So this may look different, like Lydia mentioned, the, um, the activities and the content that students engage with in the different participation modes may look a little bit different, but we wanna ensure that students can get to the same outcome. 
For example, think about our, the weekly quiz that the instructor needs to give to the students. How, how will we assess each of the um, students in their chosen participation mode? The third principle of High Flex is reusability. So how is the instructor gonna make sure that the resources that students need to succeed will be available to all of the students? For example, the instructor could post some files and some information to Moodle, or perhaps the instructor is gonna give out some information in class. Um, perhaps their, uh, a lecture will be recorded. And we're gonna talk about some more specific ways of using these resources and artifacts in a, in a second. And then of course the last principle is accessibility. So how are you ensuring that all of the students are able to access the resources equitably? So we need to take into consideration again the captioning of our videos, the accessibility of the files, but we also are gonna to wanna to provide some low tech or maybe even no tech options for our students who don't have the same access to internet and technology that maybe other students may have. So again, that's where that student choice comes in, um, make sure, making sure we provide enough options for all of our students. So let's talk about a few options that we might present to this instructor teaching this, partic this particular course um, and looking specifically at that lecture component of the course. So we have three different modalities that we want to offer. We want to offer in class face to face. We want to offer remote synchronous options, meaning that students can remote into the lecture. And then we also want to have an online asynchronous component. So since the course is already designed as a face-to-face -face course, and depending on the size and location, the instructor may continue to offer in-person lectures to the students who still want to come to campus and interact in person with the instructor. So in addition to um, having this in-person lecture, a very easy way to offer a remote synchronous option is to somehow capture that lecture uh, for students to zoom in or somehow access the, the lecture remotely. And so to, uh, to provide this live lecture option, you may want to consider using a, a tool like Zoom, um, specifically the Zoom webinar that we're using now, where you can make sure that um, you have very specific controls over the participants in your uh, webinar or in your live streamed class. Um, and the benefits of offering this remote synchronous lecture is that it's the closest to replicating an in-person class, but remotely. And some would consider this to be the least disruptive option to the student experience because you're still able to provide that personal interaction in real time with the students that are still remoting into the lecture. Um, so th that kind of handles our face-to-face our -face, um, and remote synchronous options. But what about those students who can't attend synchronously? Uh, we have some alternative methods that um, you may want to uh, present your content in for those students. And this um, is much more, um, this is thinking more about the best practices for online development of your courses, which, you know, an, uh, putting your course online isn't just a matter of taking that synchronous lecture, a recording of your lecture, and providing the PowerPoint and say, okay, it's an online course. It's really about strategically making resources available asynchronously to students that go beyond just a recording of your live lecture and a PowerPoint. Um, and we'll talk about what those look like. So what you could do for this asynchronous component is in addition to providing a link to that live lecture um, that you know, students could watch at any time, that recording of the live lecture, you might also want to post uh, a few mini lectures where you are providing a very short summary of some of the major concepts that you're covering within the class. Um, you may also want to organize your PowerPoint or lecture notes into a Moodle book uh, uh, resource. This is a, a resource in Moodle that's designed to present content in a richly formatted way. So you could include notes from your class, you could include relevant images, YouTube videos, and links to relevant articles. So it's providing the supplemental um, uh, format for your lecture that all students could access. Um, and then of course providing that recording to a lecture and posting it to Moodle for later viewing. Um, this is another one of those examples of something that's going to benefit all students, even the ones that are still attending your class face-to-face. -face. 
because say a student zoned out for an important part of the lecture and they want to go back and um, oh, I apologize they want to go back and review that particular part by making that recording available on Moodle they can go back and watch it at their leisure so these asynchronous options allow for more convenient and flexible access for your students and these resources will be more accessible to your students than, our, than remote synchronous interaction due to internet and computer access. So that's why this online asynchronous component um, is, is combining elements of that uh, filmed live lecture as well as other um, you know, kind of lower bandwidth options such as a Moodle book with notes um, and PowerPoint slides. So for this scenario, I may suggest, you know, we want to offer that live face-to-face -face uh, lecture, a live Zoom stream of the lecture, and then, of course, posting a recording, a link to the recording of that Zoom lecture to Moodle. Additionally, the instructor might uh, take that PowerPoint uh, lecture material and transition it into a Moodle book where they're giving a little bit more context, the same context that they would give in class for those PowerPoint slides, and maybe even linking out to some great supplemental resources that will really help students um, understand the content and apply it. So when we're applying those four principles, this strategy checks out. So with learner choice, we're allowing students how they choose and attend the lecture. Equivalency um, by providing that link to the recording, as well as um, a new format for your lecture material in the Moodle book with supplemental resources. Uh, we're having, we're making sure that the lecture material covers the same topics, regardless of the modality that it's viewed in. And then finally, reusability and accessibility. All of the resources that you've created for that particular week are available online. If you use that Zoom capture for the recording, it's gonna be automatically captioned. And if you've been developing your PowerPoints in accordance with the accessibility guidelines, then it will be a relatively light lift to make sure that the remainder of your resources are, um, are accessible and meet those standards. In addition, um, using the Moodle book, it has a lot of tools built into it that will ensure accessibility, including alt text, headings, all of that stuff that, um, that is needed in order to meet those accessibility standards. The second major part of this instructor's course was student engagement, or those discussions that the instructor wanted to have with the class regarding the lecture content. So here we have some examples of ways that this instructor can um, allow students to choose how they are going to partic participate in, in um, a discussion relevant to the lecture content. So imagine that after the lecture, you start engaging your face-to-face -face students in a discussion. Maybe you, know, you, you pose a question to them or um, you ask them to begin discussing a problem. You can have them discuss both with you, both with their peers who are also attending face-to-face. -face. And then any students who are also participating via Zoom remotely could also participate in this discussion by inputting their responses into the chat, just like you're doing here by um, engaging with us. Or the students could also use the Zoom response options, such as raising their hand. Um, there's a polling feature, as you, as you saw earlier. Um, so they could use those options as well, so that your students who are attending remotely are also participating in your discussion. It would be best practice to pause your in-class discussion to, to ensure that you're sharing responses from your remote students so that they feel a part of the class and it doesn't feel like it's two separate conversations that are happening. For our online asynchronous students, we may choose to include a Moodle forum to, um, to allow students to post their answers there. This is another example of a, an activity or a method that would benefit all students. Perhaps not all of your students in your face-to-face -face class participated in your discussion. Maybe some of your students are a little shy about sharing their answers to your question um, in the face-to-face -face class. Or maybe you, you just simply didn't get to hear everybody's answer. By actually continuing that discussion and bring, 
extending it from your face-to-face -face class and bringing it over to Moodle. You give students more time to think about their answer, to formulate what their opinion is about your question. You allow students who maybe were more hesitant or didn't get the opportunity to provide their answer in person um, to, to give an answer. And you, you're also ensuring that all of your students are interacting with one another. So we don't want to silo those online students um, by any means. So we want to ensure that all of the students are able to interact with one another. If you want to facilitate some type of small group discussion, um, either in class or remotely via Zoom, you could also do that. Um, Zoom has a function called breakout rooms where you could um, have smaller groups of students um, meeting in one bigger meeting. Um, and if you would like more information about that, you can join HyperCare when we, um, when we get back on July 6th. So looking at engagement and how these ideas meet the four principles of the high flex model, again, we're giving students though, that choice about how they're participating in the discussion. It's equivalent because all students are discussing the same topic. So whether or not they are joining face-to-face, -face, um, remotely via Zoom or online, they're still gonna be discussing the same topics. It can be reusable. A Moodle forum um, is, a, is reusable in and of itself. Um, if you decide to record that in-class discussion, um, you could also post that if you wanted to. Um, and then it is accessible because all of our students are being able to participate. We are providing a no tech option for students who need it. They can come to class. Um, and we're providing that sort of low tech option with the Moodle forum. Students don't need a whole lot of bandwidth in order to participate in the forum. And it is ADA compliant by itself. Um, you just want to ensure that any prompts or any resources that you may provide in the forum are also accessible. So let's talk about some assessment options for this particular scenario. So remember that assessments are going to be those formally graded demonstrations, that formal evidence that students have mastered those learning outcomes. And of course, this can come in many different formats as we addressed in workshop one, reports, presentations, quizzes, exams, so on and so forth. Um, and it's probably best practice to make sure that those larger assessments are going to be the same for all modalities, just to ensure that equivalency. But there are gonna be some options um, that you may wanna consider when offering a high flex course for assessments. So for those in-class students, you could just allow them to take their exams in the classroom as they normally would. For assignments, they could submit their assignments in class, get feedback from you in class, um, and that covers that, that in-class uh, assessment component. Um, however, if we're thinking about some remote synchronous ways that you could provide assessments or provide support for assessments, um, you could uh, definitely offer some remote Zoom study sessions where maybe the entire class zooms in remotely and on a Sunday and you're able to answer questions that students may have before an exam and any students who weren't able to attend that particular study session, um, they can view the recording after the fact. Um, I also heard from a couple of instructors in the quick transition last semester or excuse me in the spring that some of them chose to actually proctor their exams via Zoom, where they had, you know, probably a smaller class uh, where they were able to get the students to log into Zoom, enable their cameras, and watch the students complete their exam in Zoom. Now, there's definitely some barriers that you're going to have to address by proctoring exams via Zoom. Um, and we would probably recommend using a proctoring service such as ProctorU that will actually do this remote proctoring for you um, and have a professional proctor who's actually watching the student and making sure that they aren't utilizing any resources that they're not allowed to. But this is also something that I've heard instructors do in the past. And then of course, for your online offerings, you can build that quiz or exam into Moodle and have that um, proctored via ProctorU. Um, 
or have the student submit the assignment into a Moodle assignment, um, upload their assignment there. So for this class, um, we might want, this is one of those circumstances where offering three different modalities for a weekly quiz may not be the best or smartest option. Um, so, and that's okay. Um, if you uh, have executed high flex in the delivery of your lectures, in some of your engagement activities, but all the assessments have to be in one modality, that's okay, as long as you're making this, these expectations clear up front with your students. Um, so for this particular class, it may not be smart to offer this in three modalities. Instead, you may just wanna have that online quiz available um, through a certain due date on Moodle, where students who attended in class, who attended in remote synchronously, or who completed the course components online, can finish that exam or that quiz all at the same time. So in reviewing those four principles, like I said with learner choice, this is a scenario where you may not be able to offer students much of a choice in order to protect the integrity of the exam that you're giving or the quiz that you're assessing them. Um, however, in terms of equivalency, all students are taking the same quiz or maybe it's not the same exact quiz, the quiz questions are written around the same outcomes, so students are being assessed um, on the same outcomes. And then in terms of reusability and accessibility, since the quiz is built into Moodle, it's reusable and it's accessible to all students. So to summarize this, sesh, this section of um, options and, and you know, scenarios that we brought up, we're gonna summarize it looking, looking through the lens of some best practices that you may um, consider as you're thinking about how you might apply this to your own course. So the first best practice that we wanna suggest is to remember to engage all of your students regardless of the participation modality that they've chosen. Um, so equal, equal engagement for your in-person, your remote, and your online students. And one way that you can do this is by pausing um, throughout your, your lecture or, or breaking, sort of breaking up longer pieces of content into smaller bits where you can embed some type of formative assessment or some type of discussion and reflection um, for, for your students. So this not only helps promote retention of information for your students, it allows them to process their, the information that they're getting, but it also allows you to um, ensure that you can respond to any questions or issues that the students may be having. The second best practice that we would suggest is to try to think of ways of how you can extend in-class discussions or activities online. One way you can do this is by using your online content to introduce topics while leaving the more in-depth application and analysis for those face-to-face -face meetings. And those could also include, you know, some small group discussions, maybe some group work, obviously still following the appropriate um, university approved social distancing guidelines. If you do decide to do that, ensure that you're explicit about the expectations of participation for both your face-to-face -face and online students. Um, if you're going to have, if you're going to offer students to participate remotely, ensure that they understand what it means to participate remotely. Um, are they going to be expected to um, use their microphone to participate or type in the chat? Um, you may provide an online etiquette statement for your online students. Um, you know, does participation factor into their grade? So these are things that you want to ensure that you are explicit about so that all students have the same baseline and, and the same information. And then lastly, ensure that your assessments are aligned to your course outcomes and that you're using your assessments to help provide feedback to your students. One way to do this is by using the auto graded quizzes or the lessons in Moodle. So those are great for providing immediate feedback to your students. Um, some type of ongoing or informal assessment 
throughout your lectures or activities is also a good way to give students feedback. And make sure that the, the feedback is timely and also significant for your students. So I know that Oh, oh, oh go Lydia, ahead, sorry, we have a good, a really good question that came in through the chat and I just want to pose it. It's more of a logistics question. So uh, you mentioned having uh, perhaps using something like Zoom in your face to face in class session and having students join remotely. Um, so the question is, does everyone log in with Zoom, but the face to face students mute themselves and um, as their voices will be picked up by a shared audio feed. So specifically, can the remote students share directly through audio in a class discussion, or is this done through chat or comments sent to the instructor? So um, what are your recommendations as far as how to facilitate that, that logistics, the logistics part uh, with the face-to-face -face class? So as far as what you can and cannot do, um, if you wanted students to participate synchronously through Zoom by, you know, I, I saw someone raise their hand just a second ago. Um, and, it, and you are, you have made it able, you've made it able for those students to share their audio, they would be able to respond in real time. However, if you have a student who has a poor internet connection, or maybe you're in a classroom who doesn't have a great, you know, set of speakers, that might not be the best option for that particular discussion. Instead, you might suggest that students um, capture their questions and comments and put them into the chat pod and at strategic points throughout the, your lecture, maybe after you've gone over a point, you say, hey, you know, let's turn it over to the remote students. What are your thoughts um, and have them respond and then you're able to either share your screen and, and show those responses to other students that are attending face to face or you can just read those out and make that as a as a part of the conversation there. Did that sort of cover what all we needed to? I think so. And one thing too to keep in mind is that not all students will have a maybe a computer or a device that enables them to join Zoom in a face-to-face -face session. So uh, you might have a student who comes to class, doesn't have a cell phone or forgot their cell phone, doesn't have a laptop, and uh, might have a great question. And whenever you have students joining remotely via Zoom, what might be helpful is as the instructor, you can repeat that question for your remote listeners. Um, so especially if you're teaching a large classroom, you might have a microphone at the front of the classroom, but those questions might not be picked up. Uh, so just be aware of that, maybe re, you know, rephrase or summarize the question. That way, not only your remote live uh, listeners will hear the question, but also for the recording as well. Um, so I hope that fully answers your, your question. If not, feel free, please, uh, you know, re reply in the chat and, and let us know if we can clarify further. And a lot, of, a lot of your questions will probably be with logistics. And I think the best way to work through what's going to work best for your class is thinking about class size, class level, even like student maturity in the class, because you may not want to open up a free for all zoom lecture for a large, you know, survey class where you might have students who use zoom for, you know, not the best, uh, the best outcomes. Whereas if you had, you know, a higher level, smaller class opening up that zoom channel um, for a student to raise their hand remotely and say, Hey, I have something to say to the class that might be a better possibility for that particular class. So as you're thinking about, you know, you're starting small, remember, start small, think deep, think about a particular topic or a module or a week of material for one of your fall, fall courses. And what do you want students to know and demonstrate by the end of that week? What, what is the outcome of that week? And how could you use the principles of high flex to design a part of that week or even just offer the lecture in three modalities for that week for students to achieve that. So start thinking about that. If you have ideas or questions, start putting those in the chat pod as we go through the next couple of slides and then we'll um, finish up with questions. Lydia, I'd like to, to pause here for a sec, interrupt, I should say. Uh, so whenever posting your, your questions or your ideas, if it's something that isn't uh, maybe really too specific uh, to our, us panelists, I do encourage you to select the option to 
um, to allow your fellow attendees, your fellow colleagues here in today's session to see that question as well. That way they can benefit from not only the question that you pose, but also the answer that's provided. So whenever you share, I do recommend um, selecting all attendees so everyone can see that question. So the last thing, the last major thing we're going to cover today is how do you go about organizing and um, sort of planning for this high flex um, for, for the strategies you're going to apply. Um, so one strategy that, that you can use to begin organizing, organizing your course is called an alignment map. If you attended or maybe watched the recording of workshop one, um, or if you've looked in the Moodle resource course, this may look familiar to you. And what this um, map does is it has um, cells for you to organize your outcomes, your instructional materials, your, and your activities and assessments. The reason we use this particular layout is because it's helpful not only to see that your outcomes materials and assessments are aligned, but also it helps you think about how you are actually going to offer what modality you're going to offer those things in. So this document can be used as a worksheet as you plan and, and configure your course for the fall. It's not something that you need to submit as part of this professional development series, but it's just a resource that we recommend to you to use so that you can begin organizing your materials and your course. This specific map looks slightly different from the one um, that you may have seen in workshop one because it's been modified specifically for those instructors who are interested or plan on um, facilitating a blended course or a high flex course in the fall. So the main differences um, for this course or that you can see in the instructional materials and the activities and assessments columns, there are now two cells, one for face-to-face -face and one for online. So you can um, indicate how you're going to provide those, um, those components of your course by putting them in the, in the appropriate cell, as well as labeling them if you're gonna provide them face-to-face, -face, synchronous online or asynchronous online. And then the other main difference is this last column, which is how you're going to integrate your in-class components with your online components. So remember that we're not designing different versions of one course. We're designing one course that incorporates different modalities. So we want to ensure that um, the, if we provide resources online and face-to-face, that those materials are both cohesive and strategically integrated um, so to reduce student confusion and to reduce it feeling like two separate courses. So what we've done is we've sort of taken the strategy, the example course that we looked at and we've kind of plugged it into this map so you can see how you might actually go about and filling it in. Um, you, you'll notice that all students, regardless of how they participate, are going to read some chapters of the, of the textbook. And then this instructor is offering face-to-face, uh, -face, synchronous online um, lecture. And then for the asynchronous online students, the instructor has built a Moodle book that includes a mini lecture, a textual summary, and some curated resources. Um, so the instructor could also post a recording of the face-to-face um, -face lecture if they if they chose to, but you can see this is one of the this is an example of how the, um, the resources are equivalent, but they're not necessarily exactly the same. Um, in the sec in the third column, activities and assessments, you can see how the discussion takes place both face-to-face and online, just like we discussed. And then like Lydia discussed, the, the Moodle quiz is simply gonna be, or the weekly quiz, is simply gonna be um, asynchronous online for all students. The last cell um, you hear, it just describes 
how those activities are integrated with each other and considering the order in which in which students are engaging with the activities that I've posed. And so as you're working, as you're using this map, if you choose to use this map and if you're thinking about high flex, this integration of in-class and online components might be where you capture some of your um, uh, ideas about potential barriers for you and the student, some questions that you may have about logistics, what's going to be the best method. And so this can also be kind of a, a work area for you to capture those critical questions as you're planning. And then if you could take something like this to a um, to one of those hypercare hours um, with an LXD, we could definitely help you um, work through those potential barriers um, in real time. So now it's time to address any questions that we have gotten in the chat box. Um, while you, uh, while we kind of take a look at the chat box, let me just remind you where to find those resources on um, LSU Online Faculty Resources page. And we'll make sure to share out a link to the recording of this webinar in best practices with uh, the high flex course design model, along with the blank alignment map. Um, and feel free to just share this out to uh, your colleagues, anyone who might be um, considering something like this for their course. So while, um, if there's any remaining questions, feel free to add those to the chat box. But I did wanna take a moment to show you where to find those um, faculty resources. So we're um, at online.lsu.edu. This is the LSU Online and Continuing Education website. Uh, we want to go to about LSU online and then there's a um, an area called faculty resources. This is where you'll find training and events, resources and support, our great learn and go video series, and then some other information about LSU online. Um, to view the information about our future fall 2020 professional development workshop series, uh, you can view that here. We have um, the recording of workshop one, if you missed that uh, last week. Um, you can also register to attend workshop three. And then we also have that uh, Moodle course that, have, that has a lot of really great learning and teaching resources um, available to you. And it is now open for self-enrollment. Um, when available, we will also have the campus Moodle template that you can request um, through this website. The link will be added here as soon as that Moodle template is available. So that's my bit. I'm gonna stop the share for a second and open it up for questions. So we had one question from a faculty member who asked, what do you think about having all lecture content online asking in-person students to watch that as well and using class time for Q&A and help with assignments. So that sounds like a flipped classroom approach. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say if, if uh, you know, kind of the, the rule that you can apply here is that outcomes-based approach. If it's gonna get all students to the same outcome, regardless of modality, and it's gonna work for the way you wanna deliver the content, I'd say go for it. Um, making those curated resources available and then using that class time for discussion, uh, I think is a great way to, to implement some of those elements of the high flex principles. There was, uh, sorry, another question about uh, groups. Um, so the question is, how do you recommend to split the group of students in the remote or face-to-face -face groups? Should I do a poll before classes start? What are some recommendations for dividing students up into groups? And I'm not sure if this is specific for class discussion um, or groups, group assignments, but I'm assuming class discussion. So if you're um, trying to facilitate groups and class discussions via Zoom and in person, um, it can be a little bit like a three ring circus, <laughs> but as long as you have practiced a little bit with Zoom, it's, it's fairly easy to manage. So um, Courtney mentioned Zoom breakout rooms earlier in the presentation. And this is something that uh, when you have, when you're the host for a meeting, um, you see an option in the bottom in your Zoom control panels for breakout rooms. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Hala or Courtney, I believe you can have it automatically distribute students in equal groups, or you can go in and choose them. And I know you can go in and choose them individually 
into groups. So say you have 12 students attending synchronously, dividing them into four students of uh, three groups of four students. Yes, you can do that. Um, you could just have Zoom auto assign those breakout groups. Um, if and you may want to poll your whole class at the beginning of the semester and see if students would be interested in, um, you know, participating in your class asynchronously or synchronously. Um, you know, remember that one of the principles of the high flex model is learner choice. So the learner is typically choosing how they participate um, versus being assigned a modality to participate in. And I, I'm seeing a question about potentially having, um, having students participate in synchronous class discussions and all of the students being on Zoom. Um, I can definitely see that being an option, especially if Zoom, uh, if students are able to use the, the mobile version of Zoom, because if you do post a poll or want to create groups uh, and breakout sessions, there could be a potential for students as long as they have earbuds to participate with other students who are not actually there in the classroom. Again, that would definitely take some planning and some managing of some complex logistics, but it, that, that's definitely a possibility. Anything else? Looks like we had one last question or one more question pop up. What if you have more students that want to be face to face than the spots available in the classroom? Um, so I, I'm not sure of the details of how classroom assignments are being done. Uh, that might be a, a question for your department chair or college dean. I believe that any Class, my understanding is that any classes that are going to have the option to meet face to face, they are going to be done with the consideration of the um, enrollment maximum. So um, if, if your enrollment max is, is say 20 students, um, then I believe the classroom that you will be assigned will be large enough to um, seat 20 students at a so a physically uh, distant, um, responsible, responsible manner. But that question, um, if you have any concerns about that or questions about that, I recommend contacting your department chair as far as um, classroom logistics. And I think um, we addressed all the questions that came in even um, from the beginning of the session. Um, if we didn't, uh, please, please let us know. Lydia, I'll turn things over to, to you and Court for any final words. Just try, try it out. <laughs> See if it works. I think, I think one of the great applications of this model is that it is so flexible. So if you design one class, high flex, and it just crashes and burns, um, then you can either take those lessons learned into your next design or, you know, maybe try to approach it from a different um, a different course design model, but try it out and we would love to hear your questions, your thoughts as you continue to think about high flex course design uh, for your fall courses. Um, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. And um, like we said, this recording will be available. I'll send it out in an email probably tomorrow morning along with that updated alignment map. And um, again, thank you for your attendance. Y'all have a great day.